Today is Tuesday, November 10, 2020, and we are going to be covering Module 1A on semen analysis. My name is Ashok Agarwal. I am the host of this program for the next two hours. So welcome to all of you, and uh, we are ready to begin now. I want to declare that uh, we don't have any conflict of interest. As you can see, the program was completely organized by the support from our center. And uh, no companies or outside entities were contacted for any kind of sponsorship. Webcasting was supported by our Cleveland Clinic uh, IT uh, division, David Reichling and David Wolfley. Course faculty have donated their time for this online training. Program coordinators, and we have seven of them who have volunteered their time for this training. And more importantly, the names, images, and description of certain products or instruments, which you will see during the lectures, are uh, being used routinely in our Andrology lab. Uh, and we are not endorsing any of these uh, as a speakers. So today's program, is going to be including module 1A, which is manual semen analysis, which you have seen uh, in the announcements that we have provided you. I am um, in charge of the andrology program um, at Cleveland Clinic. And uh, I'm also the director of uh, the American Center for Reproductive Medicine. I wear a couple of different hats. I am uh, very much uh, involved in uh, managing the diagnostic uh, lab of the Cleveland Clinic, as well as uh, our program in uh, male infertility research um, in, uh, in Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we are recognized as uh, the number one program in the world in the fields of male infertility, andrology, and human assisted reproduction. And this is based on uh, the number of uh, peer-reviewed publications based on the number of citation scores that we have and also based on the H index. And these are the numbers that anybody can check anywhere in the world. If you go into Scopus database uh, that rates uh, every single uh, researcher or author in the world. Um, we have a large number of uh, medical textbooks that we have written. More importantly, our program has trained over a thousand uh, scientists, clinicians, uh, graduate, undergraduate students from United States and from all over the world. So I'm very fortunate uh, to be um, um, running this program along with the very talented team of uh, uh, people who you will meet some of them today. Um, I uh, spent about 10 years at Harvard Medical School, um, where I was the director of male infertility research in urology at Brigham and Women's, and uh, also an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. So now let's talk about the program. That is enough of my introduction. Uh, Rakesh is uh, uh, an associate uh, professor uh, at, the, um, at uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, and uh, he is also uh, the assistant technical supervisor in the Andrology Center. He has uh, uh, been with us uh, for over 26, 27 years, uh, first uh, in the research area, and th then from last uh, two years, fully into the clinical arena, managing our uh, three Andrology labs uh, around Cleveland. So uh, let me uh, ask him to begin his presentation, which is on Manual Semen Analysis and World Health Organization 2010 Fifth Edition Reference Value. Uh, Rakesh, can you please take over? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Agarwal. So the topic that I'm going to discuss is Manual Semen Analysis and WHO 2010 Reference Values. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So before we... Yes, so the learning objectives that I will cover this morning are what is the need for semen analysis? What instructions should be provided to the patient so that the sample is collected correctly? 
what setup is important when we are looking for the analysis under a microscope, what comprises the macroscopic as well as the microscopic parameters, how do we calculate the motility or the progressive motility and the sperm concentration, and then some key take home messages which include the WHO reference ranges, how these have been derived in the fifth edition, and what are the some shortcomings. And then finally, the take home message. Next slide, please. Before we dive into the semen analysis, it's very important to give you an overview of how the semen uh, production occurs. Spermatozoa are produced in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. They are transported in the epididymis where they are stored. And at the time of ejaculation, they combine with the secretions of the seminal vesicles and the prostate, which are the accessory glands. And this comprises the composition of the semen sample. On to your right, you can see the uh, view of the mature spermatozoa as well as the testis and the epididymis. And on the extreme right are the seminal vesicle and the prostate. Next slide, please. So the physician is evaluating the patient and the first thing he will order is the semen analysis. And the semen analysis is done to essentially examine if there are sperm present in the ejaculate because this provides the proof of spermatogenesis. On to your right is an example of the worksheet that we follow in our andrology lab, which highlights the, the, the information about the patient, the collection, whether the sample was collected completely or there was a sample lost. Also the microscopic parameters as well as the microscopic parameters. And on to your right are two images of our andrology lab. Next slide, please. An abstinence period of two to seven days is recommended. Samples should be collected by masturbation only. And in case a patient has some reservation, they can make use of a male factor condom. The collection container should have two specimen labels or identifiers. And if the patient likes to collect the sample at home, the sample should be kept at ambient temperature so that it is not exposed to extreme temperature. And the sample must be delivered to the lab within 16 minutes after collection. Next slide, please. Uh, quality control is very important in the semen analysis, as Dr. Gupta also elaborated. The quality control includes the quality control temperature for incubators, the refrigerators, the ambient room temperature, the plastic per used, and more important, the quality control for sperm concentration. On to your right is an example of recording the temperature for the incubator. And anytime the temperature fluctuates, below or above the recommended range, proper steps must be taken to correct this action. At the bottom is the example of the quality control for sperm concentration. We make use of two latex concentrations, low and high, and this provides us the range in which the sperm concentration is expected. Next slide, please. Here I want to cover the microscopic uh, parameters. And it is important that each lab has their own protocol and not just follow the WHO manual. Each lab should develop their step-by-step -step recipe so that the technologists who are doing the analysis can perform the analysis correctly. After complete liquefaction, we check for the volume, the color, the pH, and the liquefaction time. In addition, we also look for the viscosity and if the sample is viscous, we will make use of some proteolytic enzymes such as trypsin. On to your right, you can see the sample which is placed in the incubator, and then the sample is transferred from the collection container to the tube, and we check for the pH of the sample. Next slide, please. The microscope setup is important, and this involves the use of a phase contrast microscope, a 20X objective, the use of a green filter, to increase the contrast because we are not staining the sample. The use of an ocular grid or a 10 by 10 grid is important. It is inserted in the eyepiece so that we can define the boundaries of the cells that we are counting. And the cell counter also is helpful when we are counting the cells. On to your right, you can see a picture of our andrology lab. And uh, next slide, please. 
Here, I want to give you an example of how we load the sample and what kind of counting chambers we used. In this example, I'm talking about the fixed cell counting chamber. And one of the example is the two chamber uh, Lee up counting chamber, which uh, as you can see, can load two samples. This is a fixed cover slip sample and has a fixed depth of 20 micron and a six micrometer sample can be loaded on each well. Next slide, please. Here, I want to show a short clip where one of our technologists is uh, getting ready to do this sample analysis. The previous slide is yes. So can I have the clip, please? The technologist is labeling the tube in which the sample will be transferred from the collection container. And the first thing is to check the pH of the sample and a small drop is placed on the litmus paper or the pH paper and checked for the, uh, the pH of the sample. The next step is to vortex the sample. But before we do that, it is important that the sample is carefully transferred from the collection container into the graduated centrifuge tube using a serological pipette. And we check for the volume of the sample as well as the color of the sample. We quickly vortex using a vortex mixer and check the volume and the color. The next step will be to take a pipette and carefully load six microliters of the sample on one of the well. And this is done by checking that the sample is adequately loaded in the tip and carefully releasing the sample into the well. As you can see, the sample has completely spread and it is important that we label the slide on which the sample has been loaded. Next slide, please. You have received the, the separate attachment where each step of calculating the motility and the concentration has been described. So in this example, I want to show quickly how the sperm motility and the concentration is derived. As a rule of thumb, if the sperm concentration is from 20 to 50 million, we will check the number of sperm present in two rows, and we will count the number of motile sperm, which are labeled in blue over here, and then count the non-motile sperm, which are shown in red over here. And then we observe the number of sperm counted in two rows. Next slide, please. So the example I will like to illustrate here is if we have a liquefied sample and we want to count two rows using a 20x microscope and an ocular grid which has 20 squares, then the first step we need to know is how do we calculate the row factor? And in the example I mentioned, we are counting the number of rows, which you can see in the blue box, and the number of squares for the two rows is 20. So the factor that we derive is a uh, factor of five. The next slide, please. So the example for calculating the total motility, we will count two rows and we will look for five random fields and count the number of motile sperm, which are in blue. And we count a total of 53 sperm in this example, as you can see in the second orange column. And then we will count the non-motile sperm and this will give us the total sperm in the five random fields, which in this case is a total of 129 sperm. And looking into the box on the left, you will see that the person motility can be calculated and shown as 41%. Motility is always represented as a whole number. Next slide, please. The WHO fifth edition also recommends that we calculate or we report the motility as progressive, non-progressive, or immotile. And the progressive motility is the spermatozoa, which are moving actively, and they could be linear or in large circle. Uh, earlier slide, please. Previous slide. And the non-progressive motility is any other motility which does not show progression. And here I'm going to show you a quick clip where you will be able to see the fast moving sperm with the blue track showing the path that they are moving. So in this way, we can calculate the total motility, which is the sum of the progressive and non-progressive motility, which is 40% defined by the fifth edition, and the progressive motility is defined as 32%.
In many cases, we might find spermatozoa which have a poor motility, which is less than 40%. And in those cases, the condition is termed as asthenozoospermia. Next slide, please. Here we are looking into the calculation of sperm concentration. So going back to the previous example, we had a total number of sperm that we counted in five rows were 129. As you can see, the total sperm in the box on your right in orange color. And we can calculate the concentration by looking at the total number of sperm counted, the total number of fields, the row factor, the microscope factor, and using the total number of squares in the grid. And in this case, the concentration can be calculated and reported as 25.80 million per ml. It's important to differentiate the concentration from the total count. Concentration is always per ml, and the count reflects the number of sperm in the entire ejaculate. In many situations, we might find that the concentration of the sample is below the 15 million uh, per ml cutoff. And in that condition, it is termed as oligozoospermia. And in other instances, the sperm may be completely absent from the ejaculate, and that condition is described as azoospermia. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I want to quickly touch upon how these reference ranges were derived by the WHO fifth edition. And in this situation, 2,000 samples were studied from eight countries and all the subjects in this data had accomplished the pregnancy in less than 12 months and the standardized methods were used and both progressive and non-progressive motility were reported. On to your right, I also want to highlight what are some of the key shortcomings in the WHO fifth edition? The most important is that the data is unevenly represented. The second thing is that it is very unclear if the low values reported in the fifth edition are due to the declining sperm count as reported in the literature, or it is because of the strict quality control. The next step is that these new reference values have resulted in a reclassification of many infertile patients who in the earlier editions were categorized as abnormal, but in this 2010 edition, they will all be falling into the normal category. Now, this creates a dilemma, especially in the clinical diagnosis of uh, varicocele, whether the varicocele is in the adult patients or in adolescents, the question arises, how should they be treated? Who will be the candidates who will require the surgical repair? And many of these patients who were falling in the abnormal category now will be ineligible because they will be considered as normal as per the semen parameters. And therefore, this is an ongoing debate on whether the new reference ranges should be adopted with caution and if we need to revisit the WHO 2010 reference ranges. Next slide, please. This slide shows the normal reference ranges described in the fifth centile uh, criteria. And as you can see here, the volume is 1.5 ml, the sperm concentration of 15 million, the sperm count per ejaculate of 39 million, the total motility of 40%, and a progressive motility of 32%. Any values higher than this will be considered as normal. Next slide, please. So the main takeaway from my talk will be that semen analysis is important test. However, it is very subjective and therefore it is very important that all lab staff members are very well trained into conducting the semen analysis. Each lab must develop their own step-by-step -step protocol and not just follow the WHO manual. This is important that allows each and every technician to do the semen analysis correctly and expect the desired results. It's also important that the quality control is strictly followed as Dr. Gupta illustrated, and each lab should also provide the physician with not only the addition that they are following, but also the reference ranges. And we hope that by adding or adopting these tests, the laboratory can provide correct information, the correct results to both the physician as well as the patient. 
Next slide, please. This is our Andronic group, and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Next slide, please. And this is a beautiful picture of uh, one of our main building at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rakesh. Uh, wonderful presentation uh, on uh, semen analysis. Uh, you covered a lot of uh, uh, areas here. So I want to thank uh, uh, my team here and uh, many of our uh, colleagues and trainees. Uh, these are uh, uh, many of our uh, past trainees who came uh, in front of the Andrology Center. The picture is in the front of the Andrology Center. And uh, this is a picture of uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, that you see here, a uh, beautiful spring day, um, and uh, one of our institution here, the big building, represents the cardiac center of the Cleveland Clinic. So thank you very much. Uh, this finishes the first talk, and you can connect with our program. Uh, we are posting daily our uh, research activities, uh, large number of research articles. Uh, uh, you have free access to all these publications that we are offering. We are also sharing our uh, latest research presented at ASRM, which is American Society for Reproductive Medicine, European Society for Human Reproduction, American Urological Association. Uh, also, you can learn about our uh, research opportunities and ART training, uh, which are uh, online ART training and opportunities to collaborate. You just have to find uh, me on LinkedIn, I show up at Graval Cleveland Clinic and you can send a request to join. Mm -hmm.